It's flashed by, hasn't it? In their end-of-year messages, both politicians and religious leaders have looked upon 2015 as a year of difficulty, trauma, disaster and heartache. That's the way it's been in the world, brothers and sisters, and the Brotherhood has had its fair share of difficulty and heartache, has it not, in 2015. And so it's been a difficult year from many perspectives. But there's no question at all that 2015 will go down in history as one of the most vital years in that period preceding the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. There has been an amazing number of things that have occurred this year in relation to fulfilling Bible prophecy. It has been a milestone year. Now, obviously, because that is the fact, there's a lot of things that have to be covered. And we've got two sessions, fortunately, and we're going to be able to cover a fair amount, but we're not going to be able to cover it all. So we're being selective as best we can. You know, I'm not going to just going to put up on the screen snippets from this newspaper and snippets from that internet article or whatever it may be. Yes, that will be done. But it's important that we relate those things to Bible prophecy and that we correctly interpret Bible prophecy in the process. And so there's going to be a little bit of exposition here and there along the way in our considerations uh, today. So my counsel to you is strap yourself in, buckle up and hold on because there's going to be a fair amount of stuff coming. Now, I'm not going to try and machine gun you, but we do have to go fairly quickly. So here are the principal events of 2015, at least some of the principal events. Russia continues to destabilise the Ukraine by supporting the rebels in the east and, and chasing debt. They're insisting on the repayment of, the, of Ukraine's debts for gas, etc. The idea that Putin has, of course, is to bankrupt them. But of course Putin's got his own problems along with the rest of the world's oil producers because the oil price has, has hit a record low. It's down. It was down. I don't know what it is today. I haven't seen any news for a while. It was down to $38 US a barrel. I mean that's ridiculous because it costs them about $95 in North America, in North Dakota and South Dakota to take a barrel of oil out of shale. Well, you, can't, you can't make any profit, can you? If it's costing you 95 and you're getting 38 when you sell it. So the oil producers of the world are in strife. Now OPEC had the chance about a month or so ago, they had a chance to lower their production which would have seen a price hike. They decided not to do that and they've got reasons for doing that. They're trying to kill off Iran for, for example and OPEC also is trying to kill off the American uh, shale oil industry which has brought about a glut of oil in the world today. Then we have the crisis in Syria and Iraq as ISIS in the last 12 months or so has taken control of strategic cities and towns. Been a, a pain in the neck for the nations, haven't they, ISIS? Pope Francis continues to mingle iron with clay to form the feet of the image. Britain edges closer to withdrawal from the European Union. And the six nations who were fiddling around with Iran have lifted sanctions on Iran at the expense of Israel's security. And the US, in fact, even though they might not fully realise what they've signed, has actually pledged to defend Iran against any attack on their nuclear facilities. And then Iran comes out and publishes a book saying that they will destroy Israel within 25 years. So Netanyahu goes to the United Nations in September and says, why aren't you doing anything? Why isn't there any noise about Iran's threat to destroy Israel? You know what he did? He stopped talking in the middle of his speech for 45 seconds. Now, if I stopped talking for 45 seconds, you'd all walk out. All right? 45 seconds, there was dead silence in the United Nations. You know what he was getting the message across? That's the silence that we're hearing from the nations when Israel's future is, is threatened. You say nothing. You sit there silently while Iran is threatening to destroy us. And of course, in September, Russia sent troops and planes into Syria. I'm going to talk about that a lot more this evening, God willing. And bombs all opposition quite indiscriminately to Assad, whether they be ISIS or the other rebels that are fighting Assad. And then Turkey. 
Isn't it incredible? Turkey shoots down a Russian bomber that gets three inches into its territory. And they've been hit by economic sanctions. And all the while, brothers and sisters, more and more nations are creeping towards bankruptcy. And the Great Depression that the world knows is coming. Ask Brother Hayden about that. The, the world knows that this depression is coming. And it will see the collapse of the European Union, the reformation of the old Roman Empire south of the Rhine and the Danube. It will see a revival of papal power in a way we haven't seen for a long time. It will see the sidelining of the United States and a renewed alliance, a growth of the alliance between Tarshish and its true young lions. And we're going to talk about its true young lions here this afternoon. But you know, just recently, on the 13th of November, this is where the world's attention was drawn, wasn't it? To Paris, when ISIS guerrillas went in and mowed down 130 people, 85 or more, in a theatre where there was some kind of rock and roll concert going on. Well, you know, the world mourned that, brothers and sisters, but God, God is using these incidents for his purpose because one, one immediate outcome of that was that in the first round of regional elections, which were held about a week or so after that event in December, the National Front received the largest vote in the north and south of France. Well, you might say, who's this National Front? Well, the National Front happens to be the right-wing party led by a woman called Marine Le Pen. Her father was really, really, I mean, he's fascist. And so she's tamed things down a bit. But there's a strong political swing going on in France. So this ISIS attack in Paris, which killed 130, sparked a war. The French declared war on ISIS. There was another attack, of course, back in January, wasn't there, at the, at the uh, satirical magazine. Um, Charlie Hebdo, and then against a, uh, a Jewish uh, kosher shop. Well, Hollande was praised for his response to the events in November. But his Socialist Party is in freefall in France politically. And the leader of the right-wing National Front, Marine Le Pen, looks likely to ultimately lead France at some, at some point in the future if things keep going the way they are. However, when the second round of elections were held in France, in the first round, the National Front got 29 per cent. The other parties were well behind, or some uh, 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 percentage behind them. They didn't win any seats, or didn't win any regions, I should say, uh, in that second round of the election. You know why? Because Hollande withdrew all of his Socialist Party candidates from the election because he knew he would be defeated. And he called upon his socialist people to vote for his political enemy, Nicolas Sarkozy. And that resulted, of course, in the National Front being kept out. For, it's an act of desperation by Hollande, the president of France. So what's happening here, brothers and sisters and young people? Well, what's happening is that Marine Le Pen is advocating doctrines that we know are going to be very useful in terms of Bible prophecy in the future. She advocates withdrawal from NATO, abolition of the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, limits on immigration and keeping Muslims out, and forging, and this is perhaps the most important, forging what she calls a privileged partnership with Russia. Now think about the implications of that. So what does prophecy require about Europe? You know, we read about the European nations all having one mind, which the scripture says they will, and that they will. And we read about them sort of coalescing together. Well, brothers and sisters, we've got to be careful. Let's read the scriptures carefully. Revelation 17 is pretty clear about this. In verses 12 and 13, it says, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. That one hour, of course, is 30 years. These have one mind. Yes, they do have one mind. And they shall give their power and strength unto the beast. So there's going to be 10 independent nations, but with one political agenda, which is unquestionably going to be shaped and guided by the papal mind. And the papacy, post-depression period, is going to have enormous power among the bankrupt nations 
bankrupt nations of southern Europe. The EU or the Eurozone is actually doomed. Their objective of getting rid of all borders, having this total freedom of movement in Europe is now of course under serious threat because of the crisis of refugees. The European nations are currently putting up fences. All right? They're going to try and protect their borders. So it's going in the wrong direction for the European Union. But that's exactly what the scripture requires. There's got to be 10 independent nations. And what will happen is that when Britain withdraws, it's likely that on the back of that depression, the more prosperous northern European nations and the Baltic nations will escape the clutches of the European Union because they're not prepared to go on carrying the burden of the southern bankrupt nations anymore. So what are we going to get, do you think, out of that? Well, we're going to get the revival of the old Roman Empire. This is what it's going to produce, brothers and sisters and young people. And this was the old Roman Empire in Europe. It was bounded on the north by the Rhine and the Danube, which runs into the Black Sea. Ten independent nations below the Rhine and the Danube. We're going to get it back. And of course, Scripture says we have to get it back. We have to have the revival, in a sense, of the beast of the sea, with the Pope having enormous political clout in this area uh, of Europe. The fourth beast of Daniel has to come back because Christ and the saints destroy that fourth beast, we read in Daniel chapter 7. And we have to have Babylon the Great of Revelation 17. And events are moving in that direction. But Britain will not be part of it. You know, I heard some time back, it's a long time ago now, that someone said, well, because Britain was so long a part of the Roman Empire and they were there for hundreds of years, that they're actually part of the image of Nebuchadnezzar. Scratch my head and, oh, that can't be. And it's not right. And I want, to, I want to demonstrate that it's not right. Because, you see, between 395 AD and 420 AD, the Roman Empire was finally resolved into two legs, with an emperor in Rome and another in Constantinople. And when this happened in, in 420 AD, which is when the two legs of the image were finally formed, and when Rome went through many iterations, many phases, but finally it ended up with two parts, two separate parts, which form, of course, the thighs and the legs of the image. So then, what was the history? Rome left Britain between 383 and 410 AD. So when the legs were formed, Britain was no longer part of the Roman Empire. And here's a summary from some historic uh, commentators. They say that when Theodosius died in 395 AD, his sons, Honorius, who was 12, and Arcadius, who was 17, became respective emperors of West and East. That division of the empire into Eastern and Western parts was the decisive one they say, which sent the two on separate ways. One of the two emperors had always enjoyed seniority over the other. However, the accession of Arcadius and Honorius is widely seen as the division of the Roman Empire into two completely separate parts. By 410, the separation was almost complete. And when you look at the history of Roman withdrawal from Britain, it might be very hard to read from those at the back, it began in 383, final departure of the west and north, 401, departure from Hadrian's Wall, 407, departure from the southeast, 409, expulsion of the Roman magistrates from the cities, and 410, the rescript of Honorius, end. End of Roman involvement in Britain. So it wasn't until 10 years later that we get our two distinct legs. So when the legs were formed, Britain was not part of the Roman Empire. And it's not going to be part of Babylon the Great of the future. It's not going to be part of the image. It has a separate role and a very important role. It's the role of the Tarshish power. We'll talk about it a little later on. So Britain with its young lions will oppose Gog's invasion of the land. And the historical young lions, brethren and sisters and young people, are Australia, Canada, India and New Zealand. You notice I haven't got the United States in there. That's because the United States isn't a young lion. And we'll spend a little bit of time on that in a moment. But Britain is now part of the European Union. And both Conservative and Labor sides of, of politics in Britain have supported that since Edward Heath, it was Heath, took them in in 73. You're the historian. However, Britain 
has strenuously refused to use the euro and retain the pound as its currency. And Conservative Prime Minister David Cameron today remains a strong supporter of continued membership because of the business side of the, of the equation, but 70 per cent of the British public has different intentions. They want out of Europe. And he has been bound to promise a referendum by 2017, and he knows he's going to lose it. Britain will come out of the European Union. So what is he doing now? Well, he's jousting with the European Union nations, saying, well, I want, to, I want you to give me some, you know, some uh, benefits. I want you to, to, to scale down this. I want more strict border, whatever it may be. He's arguing for improvements. He's not going to get them. So Britain eventually will come out. And so we'll have, brothers and sisters, Tarshish, standing alone from Europe and therefore having a greater need to have a strong relationship with its former colonies, with the young lions of Ezekiel 38, verse 13. Now I want to talk briefly about these powers mentioned in that verse that you can see on the screen. You see there in green, Sheba and Dedan, and then in yellow, Tarshish, we're not going to say an awful lot about Tarshish, except that you can prove from the scripture, from Ezekiel 27 and other places, and from history, <clears throat> that Britain is the Tarshish of this passage. You know, Britain itself means the land of tin. You can correct me here, John, if I don't get this right. Baratanak, the land of tin. And I went to Cornwall a few years ago, and they took me around all these old tin mines. You know, they've got these chimneys that go up. Now, I don't know which way this is around, but they also showed me Phoenician worlds. Phoenicians were living on the coast of Britain in ancient history. The British used to have one, one kind of well and the Phoenicians another. One of them had a round well and the other one had a square one. I've got no idea which was which, but there was, there was both kinds of worlds there. And so there was proof, absolute proof from what was left that the Phoenicians had been there. And they were trading in tin, which is exactly what Ezekiel 27 says about Tarshish. See? So you can prove from history, you can prove from the scripture. So among the countries who survived the global financial crisis of 2008, the best were Australia, Canada, India and New Zealand. Isn't that amazing? All have a British system of government and three share the Queen as the titular head of state. So this old World War I poster has the old lion helped by the young lions, defying his foes, Australia, Canada, India, New Zealand. Yep, you don't find America in there, and we'll point that out uh, in a moment as to why. But what about Sheba and Dedan of Ezekiel 38 verse 13? Well, Archaeological studies have supported the view that the kingdom of Sheba was the ancient Semitic civilization of Sabah or Sheba in southern Arabia. And you can have a look at the old maps. Kingdom of Sheba over here, see? Now this is Yemen today. It's called Yemen. Dedan, of course, is the, the Saudi Arabian Peninsula and the Gulf states. So we've got Sheba and Dedan. So what's happening here in Yemen in particular and in Saudi Arabia? Well, there's been some very significant shifts in 2015. Very significant. Because this article tells you from Radio Free Europe that the Saudi-backed Yemeni government of President Mansour Hadi has decided to sever diplomatic relations with Iran. The Saudi-led coalition intervened in the war in March to try to restore Yemen's government after it was forced into exile by the Houthi. Now the Houthi happened to be a Shia insurgent group with links to ISIS. The intervention comes amid concerns over what Gulf Arab states see as Ir Iran's growing influence in the region. What this is telling us is that this civil war that's been going on in Yemen for some time now is a civil war in which the Saudis and the Gulf states have got involved. Now they've got squillions. They can afford all sorts of new equipment and they're putting in tanks and armaments and troops and backing up the Yemeni government against these Houthi rebels. The result of that's going to be that Yemen, or Sheba, is going to come into the Saudi orbit. We're going to have, very soon, Sheba and Dedan. It's happening, brothers and sisters, before our very eyes. Now, the picture you can see on the screen is one that appears in some of our magazines. And you'll notice it's talking about countries supportive of Israel, 
We've got the young lions of Tarshish. We've got Australia, New Zealand, India, Canada. We've got the United States over here. I want to talk about that because I don't believe they are a young lion. I want to show you why. It's not part of our heritage, as you're going to see. All right? So we need to get this right. You know, we read Jeremiah 30 here this afternoon. What a remarkable chapter that is. Did you notice the, the use of the names Judah and Israel in that chapter? Did you notice it's all about the restoration of the Jews to the land based on Jacob returning from Haran, which 31 goes on to speak about? Yes, it's a remarkable chapter, but it says something very important about what's happening right now that will lead to Jacob's troubles. And the passage you can see on the screen there is verses 12 to 14, where we read, For thus saith Yahweh, thy bruise is incurable and thy wound is grievous. There is none to plead thy cause, that thou mayest be bound up. Thou hast no healing medicines. All thy lovers have forgotten thee. They seek thee not. For I have wounded thee, he goes on to talk about his wounding, because of their iniquities. Well, what about America's relationship with Israel? It's been very strong for a long time. It's not strong today. Go back into history. Go back to the times of 1947-48. President Harry Truman, after the death of Roosevelt, was instrumental in gaining statehood for Israel under the hand of God, an admission later on in 49 to the United Nations. The US helped Israel win three wars, the Sinai Campaign of 56, the Six-Day War of 1967, and the Yom Kippur War of 1973. And because, of course, Israel was ruled by socialist governments and prime ministers who couldn't run a picnic, leave alone a country. They had no idea about economics. They had to rely upon the financial support of the US for decades. But today, Israel has a leader since 1996, twice he's been in power, called Benjamin Netanyahu. He is a MBA, a master of business. He's a very astute politician and he's a manager. And that country has gone now to the top of the table. They are number three on the index of countries, of companies, I should say, that are most prosperous in the world. You've got the companies of America and China in front of them, but the next one is Israel, number three. They're right up there. They don't need US support anymore to prop themselves, to prop them up. And of course, the US can't afford it. They're $19 trillion in debt already. But under President Obama, the, the relationship between Israel and the US has collapsed sunk to its lowest level in modern history. And I want to show you why this is the case, brothers and sisters. It's the case because there's a lot of studies that are now circulating in the State Department like this one. See the heading? The US is preparing for a post-Israel Middle East. Now, has that sunk in? The US is preparing for a post-Israel Middle East, which means no Israel in the Middle East. Eh? Yeah, it's true. In the wake of recent events, such as the US State Department defending boycotts against Israel's settlements and the US's appeasement to Iran, it appears that the Obama administration has been influenced by a study titled Preparing for a Post-Israel Middle East. In that study, Israel was classified as the greatest threat to the US. I beg your pardon? Israel is classified as the greatest threat to the US because strong US-Israeli bilateral relations hinders the US from having normal relations with Arab and Muslim countries, as well as increasingly the greater international community. Can you believe that? All thy lovers have forgotten thee, just prior to Armageddon. It's happening. So what is in the Iran nuclear deal that was signed recently, September this year? Well, the Republican Donald Trump, and he's a nutcase, isn't he, really, said that under the Iran nuclear agreement, if Israel were to attack Iran, the US would have to come to Tehran's aid. Is he correct? Well, some don't think so. In an annex, the plan of action calls for cooperation by Western powers with Iran on nuclear safety is appropriate. Nowhere in the agreement, however, is the US or any other party required to come to the defence of Iran if attacked. However, 
Under pressure, John Kerry, who was the Secretary of State, a bit like a foreign relations minister, was not quite so sure. He was not quite sure of the full implications of what they had signed in that agreement. But I'll tell you something, Israel's very sure. They're very sure. Because you read this in the Jewish press, 23rd of July this year. You read this headline, Obama deal US to protect Iranian nuke sites from Israeli attack. The Obama deal explicitly states that the US and the other P5 plus one powers can help Iran deflect and even respond to sabotage and nuclear threats to its nuclear sites. It allows Western powers to help Iran to protect its nuclear sites and possibly even to stage a counter-attack on the source of the threat stated in that, uh, that Annex 3 of the plan. So Israel's quite sure what's meant in that plan. Can you, can you conceive of that, brothers and sisters? With the history of the US and their support for Israel, that now they look like they're committed, that if Israel decides it's going to take out the Iranian nuclear facilities by its planes and whatever, that America is going to come in on the side of Iran? Can you conceive of that? Jeremiah 30 says what's going to happen. All thy lovers have forgotten me. America is not a young lion. History will be repeated, as it often is, brothers and sisters, and the US will be sidelined by the Great Depression of the 21st century. It's coming. It's going to hit them the hardest of all nations on earth. America does not have a British system of government. It's French in many, many ways. The French won the War of Independence for America in 1783. Brother Thomas says nothing in his writings about America being a young lion. But much to the contrary, he doesn't have very complimentary things to say about America, in fact. This idea that America was a young lion arose in the middle of the 20th century when America was the world's policeman. When if America wasn't involved in the war, you couldn't win it. But it's not the case. It has never been part of our Christadelphian heritage from the early beginnings. And we need to get this right. Because events are showing that what I'm saying to you is correct. In the many references that Brother Thomas makes to the young lions in his writings, he never mentions America in that context. In fact, in the Herald of the Kingdom and Age to Come of 1860, and pages 107 and 108, this is so you can check me out, he wrote in response to a question from a sister. Her question was, what role does America play in Bible prophecy? Now that's a reasonable question. He's, he then wrote a three-page article on the subject, and this is the opening paragraph that you're going to see under the heading, The Destiny of the United States. He said, by America in the inquiry, we presume is meant the United States. In reply, we remark that this confederacy is not represented by any prophetic symbols, nor are there any verbal predictions concerning it after the manner of those concerning Babylon, Persia, Macedonia, Rome, the Ten Kingdoms, Russia, and so forth. So right from the very earliest days, the Christadelphian community did not see America in any role in Scripture at all. And what's going to happen is exactly what happened before the Second World War. There will be a Great Depression. It will sideline America. They will withdraw into themselves out of self-protection. They will become insular. They will not be interested in anybody else's wars, whoever they may be, and they'll be dragged in at the end because they might in fact become involved, like they were in the Second World War in 1941. That is the role that history will again write for America. So what about France and America? You know that when Obama came power, he sent back the bust of Winston Churchill to the British Museum and said we don't want it in the Oval Office? And he said that America's closest ally is France. Now France entered the War of Independence in America in 1778. It actually bankrupted France and led to the French Revolution of 1789. The Battle of Yorktown on the James River in 1781 was finally won by a French and US army. If the French had not have been there, if the French had not sent their navy to block the entrance to Chesapeake Bay so that the British couldn't resupply their forces at Yorktown, they would have lost. The US would have lost. They had been losing a series of battles. The Americans were on the back foot. It was the French 
who saved them. So how would they reward the French? Well, they, they rewarded the French by appointing a French finance minister. You can see his statue outside uh, the finance building next to the White House. They adopted a French governmental system, a presidential system. They celebrate Colonel Lafayette just across the, the road from the White House. There's a park. You know what's called? Lafayette Park. On the right-hand side, there's a huge bronze statue. You know of who? Colonel Lafayette. Yeah. And they accepted the Statue of Liberty from the French as a present. And they can't miss that when you, when you drive into New York. All right? And they had a Frenchman, a Frenchman design Washington, D.C. So you see, the French played a major... And that's why when you go to America, you will pass literally hundreds, and I mean hundreds, of streets named Fayette Street or Lafayette Street or Fayetteville, the town. It's all over the place. Well, who is this guy, Colonel Lafayette? Well, he lived from 1757 to 1834. He was a, a military officer in the French army, an aristocrat. He should have had his head chopped off in the French Revolution, but he didn't. He joined the American Revolution in the 1770s as a young man. He influenced Louis XVI, who did have his head chopped off, didn't he, by the guillotine, to support the War of Independence. He played a, cru a crucial role in many battles against the British on American soil, namely the Battle of Yorktown in 1781. And he convinced Louis XVI to issue the Edict of Tolerance of the Huguenots in 1787 and form the Estates General. And if you know your history, that's what brought about the French Revolution. He had a major role to play. And Brother Thomas, of course, actually had comments about this man. He played this prominent part in the French Revolution. And Brother Thomas wrote in the Herald of the Future Age, way back in 1846, it's a long time ago, he said, it is a fact that on the return of Lafayette and the French army to Europe, the American party was formed in France, which, as the breath of life from God, diffused the spirit of liberty among the French, which resulted in the reproclamation of the rights of man and abolition of the monarchy and titles of nobility in France. How much these events changed the face of human affairs is well known to every student of the history of the times. America is more French, far more French than British. Oh yeah, they talk a form of English, all right? There is a form of English, but they're really French in all of their governmental systems, in all of the, the fabric of that nation. Well, let's move on then to the, modern, the modernism of the papacy. I'm going to say very much about this, but it's important that we, rec we recognise why God would have put a 76-year-old man living on one lung, who said he only had a couple of years to live, into the position of the, of the papacy. This old grandfatherly figure from Argentina, why would he be put there? Well, he's put there for a reason, because, you see, there has to be a prophecy fulfilled, as you're going to see in a moment. This liberal-minded grandfatherly caring figure is actually a Jesuit and Jesuits don't change too much about the Catholic doctrines and practices do they? But he sounds as though he's going to change it. He had this proposal men and women with homosexual tendencies should be welcomed with respect and delicacy he said well the bishops and cardinals rejected that in October last year Francis also wants to end poverty well that's, everybody wants to end poverty to offer communion to same-sex couples and remarried divorcees and has joined the environmental debate, likening environmental abuse to social injustice. You know, he's mouthing. He's mouthing all the right things, isn't he? But he's not going to change anything. The Catholic system is iron. It's not going to change. It just sounds like it. And you know, we've got Daniel chapter 2, verses 41 and 43, that are actually being fulfilled before our very eyes. Read it carefully. Here are two verses, verse 41 and 43 of Daniel 2. This is about the feet of the image. Whereas thou sawest the feet and toes part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. Now there's the first clue. Now, the iron here, of course, represents that which has been left over from the Roman Empire, which was symbolised by iron. So what would you say has been left over from the Roman Empire today? There's no empire yet. They're building that now. It's religion. 
And iron, of course, is unyielding, just like the Catholic system is unyielding. Well, what about the miry clay? Well, that comes up in the next passage we're going to read. But did you notice what it says? Thou sawest the iron mixed with clay. Now, that word mixed is used four times. It's a Chaldean word. It actually means to commingle, to, to intermix, to, you know, to, to be, a, in fact, to be a guarantor, which is what the papacy is. So what we have here is something that's not talking about history, brothers and sisters and young people. The history of the Roman Empire was that the clay peoples who came from the north and the east made their way into the iron Roman Empire. It was the clay in history that mingled itself with the iron. This is not about that. This is about the iron mingling itself with the clay. This is very important. So let's read the next verse, verse 43. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. So who's the they there? The iron. They, the iron, shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, which is an explanation of the miry clay. But they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. So what's this man doing? He's going around mouthing democratic things. He's talking about humanism. He's talking about, you know, kindness to man and ending poverty. All the sort of things you want to hear in a socialist environment. True? That's what you want to hear. Yeah. But he's not changing anything. The iron is mingling itself with the clay. And Brother Sully had something to say about this. In the Temple of Ezekiel's prophecy, towards the end of that book, he says this. Now, I'm going to read this first paragraph because it's just a description of the image itself with its four metals. Let's just read the coloured part. He says the fourth element, in its latter day phase, this is the iron element, assumes the aspect of clay and iron mixed. That is, republicanism, represented by clay, you know, the things that belong to common man, and autocracy. Now, autocracy means you don't change. All right? you're, you're dominant. That's like iron. Shown, perhaps, in one of its most subtle aspects in the silent capture of democracy by autocratic ecclesiasticism, enabling the latter, namely the Catholic Church, to ride into power thereby. We've been watching for nearly two years now. Was it 13, 14, 15? Over two years now, we've been watching this man mingling iron with clay. And he's not going to stop. God's put him there for a reason. I want to turn now to Russia and Israel today. Of the 8.18 million in the land of Israel today, 1.6 million are Russian Jews and 1.7 million are Arabs. In May 2013, there were 10,000 Red Army, that is Russian Army veterans, who had fought in World War II living in Israel. Now, calculate that. World War II ended in 1945. How long ago is that? A long time, isn't it? These guys, and there are 10,000 of them, at least in 2013, 10,000 of them living in Israel who had fought under Stalin in the Russian army. They've got to be in their late 80s or early 90s, don't they? That's a horrendous, I mean, that's a ridiculous number. So the links between Russia and Israel today are very strong because when the USSR fell apart, most of these 1.6 million Russian Jews came to Israel from Russia in the 1990s. They're, as I said in our study, they're the brains trust of Russia, which is why Israel is so strong today in technology. Putin visited Israel, 25th of June 2012. He said the talks had been detailed and very useful. Shimon Peres, the president at the time in Israel, visited Moscow on the 7th of November 2012 for the inauguration of the Jewish Museum of Tol and Tolerance Center in Moscow. And then in May 2013, this ship turned up in Haifa Harbor. And they brought many of those 10,000 Russian war veterans from the Red Army onto the deck of this ship. And this is what was said about that. See there in the green, 
This is what the Russians said about that visit. There is something to be understood from this for the contemporary Middle East. Where we decided to make anchor is a clear statement, both to the Israelis and the entire region. The relationship between Russia and Israel is growing, while the relationship between Israel and America is collapsing. Can you see where that might be heading, brothers and sisters? It's heading to a fulfilment of Bible prophecy. You know what it is? Just like Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah of old, offered a sign by Yahweh in Isaiah chapter 7 that God would help him against his enemies to the north, Israel, and to the northeast, Syria, refused the sign and went to the Assyrians, who are a type of latter-day Gog. Ahaz made a covenant with the Assyrians to defend himself against his enemies. And Israel is heading in the same direction. That is what's going to happen. And this growing cooperation with Russia, the meeting on the 20th of November 2013, another one, September 2015, Netanyahu rushed off to Moscow because now Russian troops and planes were in Syria. And he didn't want to end up shooting down a Russian plane like the idiotic Turks. Because you get into trouble, real trouble. So he made sure that he went there. But you know what's happening there is a growing relationship. And this Ahaz style peace deal with the latter day Assyrian will resolve Israel's problem with Iran. You know, if I'm gonna, tonight, God willing, we're going to show that, that Russia is going to take control of this region, it's going to become the king of the north by taking the area from Syria across to Pakistan, the old Seleucid kingdom. And when it does that, it's going to have control of Iran. So it will dictate what happens in Iran. And one of the things that will be in this peace deal between Israel and Russia will that Russia will say to Israel, don't worry about the nuclear bombs that the Iranians are building. They're not going to be used against you. They'll also give them, of course, the license to get rid of Hezbollah, which is the Iranian-supported uh, uh, people in southern Lebanon, and to deal with the Hamas. There's going to be a lot of things change when that agreement is made between Israel and the Russian power. And Israel's being squeezed in that direction. Have a look at this report in the Associated Press of 19th of October this year. There is little doubt that the presence of Russian forces introduces a new and somewhat constraining variable in Israeli strategic thinking. Iran has agreed to purchase 21 billion of aircraft and satellite equipment from Russia. One of the largest military transactions in Russian history and a transaction made possible through the lifting of sanctions in September. What this means is that Israel is not only surrounded by Muslim neighbours with evil intent, but Russia directly or indirectly could be in an adversarial position as well. From the defensive position Israel is in, there aren't easy answers, but the Bible says what the answer is. They will make a covenant with the Assyrians. So this is going on, brothers and sisters. In the past, the support of the United States served as a counterweight, says this article, to the hostile intent of Israel's Arab neighbours. However, the Iran deal militates against active US assistance. For the Obama team, Israel is a distraction, standing in the way of a regional plan that includes US withdrawal and Iranian hegemony. Russia's enlarged military footprint in Syria has not even led to a whimper from President Obama. A silence that sends a clear and uncluttered message to Israel. As a consequence, Israel is on its own, unmoored from ties to the United States. You begin to see why this year has been important. There's a lot of things happening. Now, this may go, this may be you know, too subtle for, for some of us, brothers and sisters, but the angels are out there furiously working across a wide range of things that are happening in our world. So what would this covenant between Russia and Israel achieve? Well, Russian control of Syria removes the last enemy among nations surrounding Israel. Russian domination of Iran would end the nuclear threat, as we said. Any agreement would include Russian approval for Israel to eliminate Iranian-backed Hezbollah in southern in Lebanon. And Israel will annex the West Bank, ancient Samaria, in fulfilment of Ezekiel 38 and verse 8. And the Gaza Strip, would become the homeland of the uh, Palestinians, as is implied by Joel 3 and Zephaniah 2. You know, this is one prophecy that will be fulfilled. 
Now, we don't know exactly when, whether this will come on the back of the agreement, whether it comes on the back of the depression, we don't know. What we do know is that when Netanyahu won the recent election in Israel, you know what he said? I mean, he didn't publicise this too much, but he said Israel's eventually going to annex the West Bank. And that's why they're promoting settlements there. All right? That's why the Americans and others are very upset about this. He, he has intentions of annexing the West Bank, and the Bible says that Israel will annex the West Bank. Because it says this in Ezekiel 38 and verse 8. It says that when Gog comes down into the land, they come down upon the mountains of Israel. And the mountains of Israel just happen to be, 90% of them just happen to be in the West Bank, from Hebron up here to Gilboa. 90%. So that means that by the time of Armageddon, Israel is going to have possession of the West Bank. There's not going to be a Palestinian state there. Now, when Peter and I and our group arrived at Shechem about eight months ago, and we went into the old uh, the ruins of Shechem, I mean, it sends chills up your spine because you know what happened in this place. You know, you've got all those events of Genesis 34 and so on. We walked in, there's a brand new sign advertising this, this new area that they're, they're doing up to get tourists in there, see? And this brand new sign, brand spanking new, had across the top of it, the State of Palestine. Well, there is no State of Palestine. It doesn't exist. All right? It's a furphy. It's not going to happen. The West Bank is going to become part of Israel proper. Israel will annex it, an annex it before Armageddon. So Israel is edging closer to Russia. The Syrian crisis has brought Russia to its very northern doorstep. And Netanyahu said this in October this year. He said, Israel is aware of the fact that it has a Russian border now. Interesting, isn't it? It's got a Russian border now. Israel is a small, strong country, he said, and it needs to make sure it doesn't enter any unnecessary conflicts. Read between the lines. Yeah, you can see where that's heading, can't you? Threatened, and with its relationship with the American Obama administration and maybe even its successor in tatters, and Russia at its borders, Israel will be forced to consider its future allies in the region, and the Bible tells us what's going to happen. So finally, brothers and sisters and young people, I want to turn to this depression that we've been talking about. Now, we're not going to have a great deal of time to deal with this at any length. But it's very important that we know that this is coming and how important it is for us. Because, you see, the pattern is set out by the Lord Jesus Christ very, very plainly in Luke chapter 17. And you're all familiar with this, with this text in Luke 17. Well, in, in fact, we'll be going there on Saturday morning, God willing, in the exhortation. It's telling us in this passage that there is a common denominator. The reason why the Lord chooses the days of, of Noah and the days of Lot is there's a common denominator between these two eras of history. Both were eras of divine judgment. Both were times of prosperity. Both provide the pattern for Christ's return to the earth like no other eras. And as, uh, as our brother John pointed out the other day, when Genesis 19 was written, it's written, it's got a lot of import there for us. Because you see, we're going to have two angels turn up at our door one day. Just like Lot and his family did. And it's going to be the night before the whole system crashes. And that's why he chooses the days of Noah and Lot. So God locks Noah away in the ark, shuts the door, the whole system collapses. He pulls Lot and his family out of Sodom, the whole local economy collapses. That's the pattern. That's how it's going to happen. So in Noah's day, there was general prosperity for 120. That doesn't mean everybody was a millionaire. You know, I get people come to me and say, well, you say we're in times of prosperity today. What about us all poor, our poor people? You know, I'm poor, I don't have any money. Please. I mean, there's never been a time of greater prosperity in our world than the one we live in. Of course you're always going to have the poor people. Christ said that, didn't he? There's always going to be poor people but there's more people today than there ever was who are prosperous. 
who have got, entered what they call the middle class, if there's any such thing. Yes, we are in times of general prosperity, though there are poor people around. In the times of Lot, there was local, regional prosperity, like Rodney was talking about when he was playing the part of Lot last night. But you know, there's something very significant about this text in, in Luke 17, 26 to 30. Christ makes no mention of violence and immorality. Now, that doesn't mean they weren't going to happen. They have happened, haven't they? But he doesn't mention that. Why not? Well, he's not interested in that. He's interested in one thing, and he tells us what it is. He says, remember Lot's wife. She was destroyed, as we found out last night, again, by prosperity. Remember Lot's wife. And that's the great danger. So when the day comes, brothers and sisters, it's going to lead to a time of trouble such as never was. When we are taken, when the dead are raised, and when we are taken to judgment, in terms of Daniel chapter 12 and verses 1 and 2, it's at that time, we are told in that prophecy, that the time of trouble such as never was begins. It's not going to be a very nice time for those who are left behind. So it's very important for us to see this. And we know what, what the days were like, the days of Noah and Lot, eating and drinking, marrying and being given and married, buying and selling, building and planting. Life totally given over to materialism of one kind of, or another. Then all their prosperity collapsed in a day when the saints were taken away. Yes, and there's further proof. When Christ wrote to the seventh ecclesia of the seven in Asia, he wrote about the times in which we live. We know that these letters are prophetic of the time from AD 96 down to the latter days. What would be the characteristic? Laodicea, you're rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing. We're in that era, brothers and sisters, and it's a time. The only letter in which he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Yeah, and he's knocking. All right. It's the letter that's concerning the people who will live at the end of the days. And there are some very ominous factors at work. US debt tops 18.8 .8 trillion, unfunded liabilities near 150 trillion in America. And the world's GDP for all nations is only 50 trillion a year. And they owe 150 trillion. And interest rates are about to go up. You know what caused the first Great Depression in 1930? The Fed raised interest rates. That's what caused it. Greece continues to rack up debt that can never be repaid, and the U European Union is get, getting very impatient with that. The European Central Bank has taken drastic steps this, this year. They've done some idiotic things. Why are they doing that? Well, Greece owes them 445 billion euros, and Spain another huge amount. All right, they're not going to get it back. They're heading towards bankruptcy. The oil price plunges through oversupply, and OPEC reacts to the US shale oil production by maintaining their production levels, and so the oil price is likely to keep even lower. Sanctions and low oil prices are pushing the Russian economy towards collapse. And other oil supply, like Venezuela, look, Venezuela has been a socialist country for three decades. And all of a sudden, the socialist government's tipped out. And they get a right-wing government. How come? Well, because the oil price has decimated that economy. You can't even buy toilet paper in Venezuela. You can't. That's how bad things are. That's why they kicked their government out. And, of course, China is just above the 6% growth peg. You know why that's important? In the 1990s and late 1990s, economists around the world said that if China ever gets to a growth rate below 6%, the rest of the world will go into a depression. They're just above 6% today. So depressions do happen. One happened in 1929, stock market crashed 30, the depression began. 10 years it lasted, and the only way you can get out of depressions is by a war. It's about to happen again, brothers and sisters. 
It's about to happen again, and the time of trouble such as never was will begin. It'll last for 10 years, that depression. They, they say 25 years. It'll last for 10 years, and there'll be a war. It'll be the Battle of Armageddon. So what will this crash trigger? International bankruptcy will force radical and rapid change. Middle East peace will be achieved at last. At last we'll have Ezekiel 38. Peace and security when Israel is locked into an agreement with the Assyrian in the north. And it will bring peace. They'll take down the wall that goes around the green line of the West Bank. They won't need their eight metre wall anymore. And they'll subdue Hamas and the Hezbollah. They're killing all these people going around trying to stab Jews at the moment, aren't they? Yeah, and they'll keep killing them until they stop. Bankruptcy will allow rapid Russian expansion without effective opposition. And a group of papal-backed nations, ten of them, will emerge in southern Europe in the territory of the old Roman Empire. And Israel will remain prosperous on the back of huge fines of oil and gas. And that's how we're going to finish our session tonight. On the latest find of oil in Israel. I think you know where it is, don't you? It just happens to be in the Golan Heights. Mm. But more of that tonight, God willing.